Hey guys, my name is Alex. I am a senior software engineer living in New York City. Between college and my professional experience, I've been in the engineering sector for over a decade now. For the past six years, I've worked in tech as a software engineer, but I've also worked as a manufacturing engineer. I have experience in biomedical engineering. I studied civil engineering. I've worked internationally. I've studied internationally. I've worked for companies with 10 employees and I've worked for companies with 200,000 employees. So I've had a lot of vastly different experiences throughout my entire engineering career. So if you guys are interested in hearing about my journey from college to now, stay tuned. I broke this video down into chapters if you just wanna to skip to the parts that you're interested in. So let me start by saying senior year of high school, I already knew I wanted to go to college for engineering. I didn't really know anything about engineering. I didn't know any engineers, or at least I didn't realize that I knew any engineers at the time. I chose engineering and specifically civil engineering for three reasons. One, I really loved architecture and home design. I would watch HDTV religiously. So when I was looking for career choices that aligned with that, architecture and civil engineering came up a lot. So I was like, okay, I'll study civil engineering and minor in architecture. The second reason I chose engineering because at that point in my life, I never ever wanted to write another essay again in my life. I've always been pretty good at English and literature, but they were my least favorite subjects in high school and middle school. I was really good at math and science though, especially calculus, and I actually really enjoyed it. And I knew that was a huge requirement for engineering. And the third main reason I wanted to study engineering is because I actually didn't know what I wanted to do after college. So an engineering degree for me was more of a safety net. My thought was that with the engineering degree, it would be much easier to hop around industries if I found something I was more passionate about. Or I could still work as an engineer and make decent money. So I got into a few really good engineering programs, but ultimately it really came down to what was the cheapest and what gave me the most value. I ended up getting a full tuition scholarship to Smith College, which is where I went. So if you're unfamiliar, Smith College is a woman's college in Massachusetts, and it's actually only 30 minutes from where I grew up. So Smith is a liberal arts school, and even though I still intended to study civil engineering, um, because they're a liberal arts school, they don't really have specialized engineering programs. So you would go pretty much get like a more general engineering degree. So for instance, when you graduate, you don't get a degree in civil engineering or electrical engineering. You get an engineering science degree. So with the engineering science degree, you first take classes in all types of engineering fields. And then towards your junior and senior year, you can start taking more specialized classes if you want to. So my first year of college, it was great socially, but academically, your girl was struggling. I was getting C's like clockwork, okay? Like getting a B minus was a good day. I eventually learned how to manage to stay afloat, but it took a lot of office hours and it took a lot of late nights. I also took my first computer science class my first year, which was Intro to Programming with Python, and I hated it, which is ironic because now I'm a software engineer that mainly codes in Python. But at the time, I just found it so frustrating and a waste of time because Again, like I wasn't going to school for computer science, I was going for civil engineering, but it was a requirement for my degree at the time and I had to take it. Socially, life was great. I met some of my best friends that are still some of the closest people in my life now. Got involved with a bunch of on-campus orgs, became a member of NSBE, which is National Society of Black Engineers. So I was really finding my tribe. Another huge turning point for me that happened, honestly, as soon as I got on the campus was I realized how small my world really was. At that point, I had never left the country, never really left the East Coast, honestly. And here I was 30 minutes away from where I grew up, meeting people from all over the world for the first time. I had never met anyone that had grown up anywhere other than the US. So I was so intrigued and inspired by my classmates, but especially the ones that moved to the US to go to college by themselves or even the ones that left home at 13 and 14 and went to boarding school in another country at 14 years old you could not pay me to go to a boarding school even in my own state even if it was 15 minutes down the road i wasn't doing it and i know this is a normal reality for some of you guys watching but i was shook i was in awe of 
how much of the world they were able to experience at just 18 years old. And it made me want to travel and do the same thing. So while I was trying to make it through my first year of college, I was also trying to secure a summer internship in engineering. And long story short, I got nothing. I was pretty upset about it at the time, but it really turned out to be one of the best things that ever happened to me. So since I grew up pretty close to my school, I ended up just taking a summer job at my school as a tour guide, which was great because I ended up learning so much about the programs and assistance that my school offered um, for travel that wasn't really widely known or talked about. So I realized there were all these programs that the school provided that would allow me to travel pretty much for free. So I ended up getting my first passport that summer. And then six months later on New Year's Day of 2013, I left the country for the first time. So I went to Costa Rica for three weeks. I lived with a family. I worked with this retired biologist that owned a turtle farm. Mind you, my Spanish was very, very bad, like muy malo. And the family and everyone I worked with all spoke Spanish. So I was really just out there, like no words, just vibes. Luckily, one of my friends was also on the trip and she spoke Spanish. So she was pretty much my translator the entire time. So that was my first ever international trip. And as soon as I got back, I was like, I need to do this again immediately. So I signed up for this two month summer internship program in Shanghai, China. It cost $3,400 and it was an unpaid internship, but my school held it down again. They had this program that pays you for unpaid internships. So it covered the cost of my trip. And honestly, it's still shocking for me to think about the fact that I actually spent an entire summer in China. And that was almost 10 years ago now. And that time I didn't know anyone that was going, nor did I know anyone that was going through the program. I literally just found the program online and just did my own research on them. And I was 100% confident that they were a legit program, but that was probably the biggest risk I took at that time. But my trip to Costa Rica definitely prepared me for being comfortable in unfamiliar places where I don't necessarily know the language. So the program ended up being amazing. I went through this company called CRCC Asia. Granted, I went 10 years ago, so I can't confirm the quality of the program now, but I remember when I got back, I was telling everyone about it, telling everyone about the program. I also made great friends on that trip that I still hang out with to this day. So as I mentioned, this program was an internship program, and so they paired you with whatever uh, internship kind of matched your field, and I was paired um, with a medical device company. The company was called Devon Medical Products and I was a biomedical engineering intern. So I'm not sure if they're still around, but their headquarters was in Pennsylvania and they had an R&D office in Shanghai, which is where I was working. They specialized in negative pressure wound therapy, which is a complicated way of saying that they just made these handheld vacuums that suck all the bad fluid out of a wound so it will heal faster. I'll post a diagram somewhere so you can see what I'm talking about. My job that summer was more on the quality assurance side. So they're working on a new product and I had to run a bunch of tests on it and write up reports on the testing. So things like checking how much fluid it can hold, making sure it worked properly in different scenarios, etc. And I actually really enjoyed it. It was definitely another transition point for me because up until that point, I thought I still wanted to be in civil engineering, even though I was on, I just finished a year or two and I really wasn't liking it that much or at least as much as I thought I would. So I thought civil engineering was close enough to architecture where I'd be able to learn about all these like cool buildings and skyscrapers and like nice looking homes. But a lot of civil engineering involves less nice looking buildings and more things like roads and bridges and things that I just was not interested in. So given the fact that I was really just more interested in building design and the aesthetic, I realized civil engineering just wasn't really for me. So this internship in China was the first time that I was actually like, wow, I can actually see myself enjoying being an engineer. I could see myself enjoying being a biomedical engineer. So when I got back from China and was starting my junior year, I was on two missions. One, to switch my career focus to biomedical engineering 
and two to study abroad for that spring semester because the travel bug could not be tamed. So my fall semester I stayed on campus and it was honestly one of the hardest, probably the actual hardest semester that I had. That was because one, if I wanted to study abroad, I had to pull my GPA back up. At that point, that last semester, it had slipped to like a 2.98 and I needed 0 0.02 points to be able to study abroad. And two, I also needed to make sure that I got enough required classes done so that I would be able to graduate on time because a few of the classes that I needed to take that spring semester weren't offered at the uh, schools abroad that I was looking at. So not only was I overloaded with all these difficult engineering courses but on top of that I just had the pressure of trying to also do well in them enough to raise my GPA to above a 3.0. So I was stressed that entire semester but in the end came out with a 3.02 and that New Year's Day again of 2014 I was on a plane this time to London. I went to Queen Mary University um, from January 1st to June 1st, so that spring semester. So I won't get into the details of the entire trip because this video is already gonna be way too long and I don't like long videos. But I will just say I had the time of my life there. Just exploring London and seeing the cultural differences between like people that grew up in the US versus the UK meeting people from all over the world. And I thought I knew a lot about the world given that three years prior, I didn't know much at all, but I was meeting people from places that I had never even heard of. Like they would tell me where they're from and I'd have to Google it and be like, wow, like I've never heard of that. And of course we did a backpacking trip in Europe. You cannot study abroad in Europe and not backpack around the continent. I went with some of my friends that were also studying in London. We went to France, to Spain, to Portugal, to the Netherlands, to Italy, to Greece. We even went to Morocco and like spent the night in the Sahara Desert. I had gotten a stipend that was supposed to last me for five months for dining from my school and I literally spent the entire thing on travel. Like I was eating rice and pasta every night in my flat so I could just save up my money to travel and it was worth it. I didn't have good food, but I got to see a lot. But it was a crazy feeling going from just getting my passport in 2012 and then less than two years later have already had visited 10 countries. So anyways, back to school. I took three engineering classes and one like random history class while I was abroad. I took a class called Intro to Biomedical Engineering and I remember really enjoying that class. We learned about the biomechanics of hip and knee replacements, which I actually learned a little bit about in the previous semester in the first uh, biomechanics class I took. We learned about what materials are safe to go into the body and how certain forces on the body may affect them. So for instance, when you walk, you're already putting pressure on certain parts of the bone. So some of the things that we learned about was like, okay, if you have an implant, like how does that pressure affect some of those materials, right? Like how does it affect the metal? How does it affect the integrity of the metal that is in your body, right? Because you don't want something like that to wear down over time because that would require a brand new surgery for a person that is, that's just not fun. <laughs> so that was a really interesting class for me. Another class I took was Intro to Web Technologies, which was another uh, computer science class. In the end, we had to create a blog site that was written in PHP. And that was actually the first time I actually really enjoyed coding. I think it had a lot to do with being able to code something up that I could interact with in a practical manner. The computer science class I took my first year, I never really made anything that came together in the end. It was more like little labs here and there, so it didn't feel that practical. I think the other reason I really enjoyed it is because the classes abroad were all pass or fail. So it didn't feel like a waste of time because I didn't have the pressure to do well in all these classes for the sake of my GPA. So so with that though, I actually did fail a class. It was the first and only class I ever failed and I was so upset. Let me explain. I had one class called Failure of Solids, which was about how strong certain materials are. And I keep saying materials a lot, but what I mean is like metals and ceramics and polymers, like things like that when I say materials. Knowing the 
properties of different materials is a huge part of a lot of different engineering fields. Anyways, the point of this class was to learn about uh, how much of a load certain materials can take before they break. And this class was pretty difficult already. So sometimes if I don't understand something, I'll jot it down and like try to figure it out at a later point. So with that said though, I felt like half the semester, I really had no clue what the professor was talking about. He kept mentioning this word aluminium that I didn't know and I just wrote down to like figure out later on. I honestly thought it was just like some new chemical I just had never heard of before. It wasn't until two months into, into the semester where he said the word and actually pointed to the word that he was saying. Guys, I was like, are you joking? It's literally aluminum. I was so upset because I tried so hard to get my American versus British conversions down before I got to London. I'm like, okay, trousers, pants, elevator, lift, meters, miles, look left, not right. And I'm like, damn, no one told me I need to memorize the periodic table in a British accent. So your grade for that class was 20% coursework, which was like one assignment, and then 80% of your grade was the final. And I failed the final real bad. So while I was in London, I was able to secure a summer internship with United Technologies as a process engineer. So I got back to Massachusetts early that June and started working a few days later. Again, it still wasn't biomedical, but since I was abroad and didn't get the chance to really go to career fairs that year, I just wasn't gonna be picky with where I was interning. So the short version of that internship experience is that on my last day, they actually gave me a return offer to work there full time after my senior year. And I remember being like completely shocked by it. I didn't even know that was a thing that they even did. My plan for after my senior year was to find a full time a medical engineering job in New York City so that kind of completely threw me off. On top of that they were offering me more money than I had ever seen in my life before. Mind you I was a brokey brokey broke college student somehow surviving off of a hundred dollars a month that got my uh that paid for my gas uh you know occasional takeout maybe just maybe a shirt from forever 21 like it was it was a tight budget okay and I somehow was doing it so hearing that number I was shook. So I took the offer and my um, senior year was really a breeze because you know I had planned to like look for a full-time job but since I didn't need to focus on that anymore I was just I was just chilling. By that time I was taking more electives that I really enjoyed. I ended up making Dean's List for the first time. So I graduated with my BS in Engineering Science in 2015. There's a tradition at my school that when you graduate with an engineering degree you get a hard hat and during the graduation ceremony they have all the engineers stand up and change their cap into the hard hat. A week after my graduation I started working full-time as a process engineer at the company I interned at the summer before. So if you're not familiar process engineers that work in manufacturing design and implement processes to ultimately build a product. And in doing so, the goal is to make the product as efficiently as possible without sacrificing quality or adding more costs. So the larger company that I worked for was United Technologies, but I worked for one of their smaller brands called Kitta. They make all types of fire alarms and fire extinguishers. You likely have a Kitta smoke detector in your house right now, or you've probably seen one of their fire ex extinguishers somewhere. So those are some of their residential products but they also make a bunch of commercial products that you'd probably never see really. And that's the side that I worked on. They manufacture these huge, super connected fire suppression systems and alarms that would go into like more commercial buildings. So, you know, like hospitals and shopping centers and things like that. The processes I worked on were usually for assembling valves and pressure switches and things like that that connected the systems together. So it was very much of an operations job, but the engineering part comes from knowing the details of the product itself, knowing how it fits in the bigger system and things like that. After the excitement of my first big girl job in my big girl apartment wore off, I realized I didn't really even like my job. <laughs> Specifically, I did not like working in 
a manufacturing plant. I had to wear steel toe boots and safety glasses pretty much every day, all day. Honestly, between the valves and the boots, it was just a very unsexy situation for me. Like my hands would be greasy all the time from having to touch different tools. Like I was feeling very rough and rugged all the time. Honestly, I felt like all I was missing was a pickup truck. Like it was, it was rough. At the time, I also desperately wanted to move to New York City. Initially, I was trying to find the same job somewhere in New York City, but a lot of non-technical engineering jobs in New York are actually kind of on the outskirts. So like New Jersey or like somewhere deep in Queens. And I was like, no, I want to be in the city. Like smack dab, here's me. Here's the Empire State Building and like, I just wanna be surrounded by Starbucks at every corner. Like that's how in the city I wanted to be. And so New Jersey wasn't gonna work for me. And on top of that, I wanted the flexibility to kind of work from anywhere. There's no worker from home in manufacturing. Maybe they're a little bit more lax, you know, after the panorama, but before that, like if you, if you needed to do your job, you had to be on site. So I knew I wanted to transition to tech and I knew I wanted to move to New York. So I moved back home um, in Massachusetts with my parents to save up for almost a year. And actually, plot twist, I originally thought I wanted to be a UX UI designer. So I made what I thought was a pretty good portfolio, learned the crap out of Sketch App and out of Photoshop. Then I applied to a bunch of entry level design jobs in New York and I would either get rejected immediately or just not hear back. So enter the Flatiron School. My thought process was, okay, even though I want to do UX UI, what if I do the software engineering bootcamp in New York City, focus on front end development, and then get into design that way. Plus it would give me the chance to live and network in New York City for a few months. And I don't know if they still do this, but back when I went, they guaranteed that you would uh, find a job within six months or they would give you your money back. So I applied in early 2017. I got in, left my job, moved to New York in April, and I started the program. I had a phenomenal time at Flatiron School. I was at the 11 Broadway location uh, in the financial district, so right in front of the Charging Bull, if you know your New York City tourist areas. And I was just living my best life in the city. The boot camp was 15 weeks, Monday through Friday, nine to six and we covered all the basics of full stack development with ruby on rails we covered you know sql no sql databases javascript react all the stuff all the basics and during my time there i realized that i actually really do like front-end development and i was going to pursue a front-end role after the boot camp instead of the ux ui there were about 20 people in my cohort only four women, including myself. But everyone was really great though. I thought the Flatiron School does a good job at fostering camaraderie within the cohort. We were all there to learn and we helped each other out whenever we needed. So yeah, I honestly have nothing bad to say about my Flatiron experience. Great TAs, great instructors. And most importantly, I felt like I learned so much. I had initially thought I would be able to easily switch from process engineering to software engineering, just because I already had the engineering degree and had taken a few computer science classes. And honestly, I'm sure I could have made the switch without going to boot camp if I just would have taken more time and gone the self-taught way or maybe made the switch within the company that I was at and then eventually moved to New York City. But going to the boot camp definitely fast-tracked both my software engineering career and also just my official move to New York. There was so much about software engineering and tech in general that I didn't even realize that I didn't know. And in hindsight, I definitely wouldn't have been a competitive enough candidate to compete uh, in the New York job market for an even entry level software engineering role before I did the bootcamp. So by August of 2017, I had graduated from Flatiron School and then the following month, I was able to secure a front-end software engineering role at a fintech startup in New York City. It had all the perks I dreamed of, good pay, unlimited vacation, occasional work from home days, free snacks. The only thing I love more than food is free food. By this time, I also had officially moved to New York City. I rented out a bedroom in a three bedroom, two bedroom apartment that I found on Craigslist, which if you live in New York, you know that finding listings online and moving in with strangers is a very normal thing here. But 
when I was telling people that don't live in New York that that was what I was doing and this is where I was living, they were like, are you crazy? My roommates were cool though and I still keep in touch with them. Anyways, back to the new job. So when I joined, it was a really early stage startup. I was one of two engineers when I joined and I think there were around like 10 employees total. And let me just say, starting my career at an early stage startup was the best way to start my engineering career. I grew so much there as an engineer. If you want to grow really quickly as a new software engineer, I highly suggest going to a startup. You get to be more of a generalist, which is great for really figuring out like what area you want to focus on. For instance, I was hired as a front end engineer, but we were a small company. So there were times where I had to work on some back end work and ultimately realized I like back end better than front end. So I became a back end engineer and have been ever since. So it's easier to discover things like that when the team structures are less rigid and you just have much less red tape than you would have at a bigger company. My main programming languages were Ruby and Kotlin. So needless to say, in my two years there, I learned a lot very quick. And it was also just cool to see firsthand how like the startup world and the VC world operate. I'm definitely grateful that was my first software engineering job. After a couple of years though, I was just at the point where I was ready to go. I was kind of burnt out, starting to feel like I wasn't growing as fast as I was initially. And I just wanted more money. By the end of 2019, I had offers to work at both New York Times and Venmo. And I'm sure from the timeline, you can tell that I ended up choosing Venmo, but getting the offer from New York Times was definitely another pinch me moment because I had wanted to work there since graduating college, mainly because I used to read it all the time. And I used to think how iconic would it be for me to move to New York and work for the New York Times. But what was even more iconic was working for Venmo. I was hired as a senior software engineer, which was crazy to me because I definitely didn't think I could reach that title with only two years of experience at the time. And I actually wasn't even targeting that level in my job search. But it definitely had a lot to do with how much I just learned at the startup I was at and how well I was able to demonstrate that in the interviews. It was interesting going back to a big company. Venmo operates as their own, but they're still owned by PayPal. So PayPal was my actual employer. It was similar to the structure of my first company where, where I worked for a brand, but they were owned by a much larger conglomerate. I worked on a few different teams at Venmo. I started on an internal team and then I started moving to teams that were more public facing. I worked on the back end of a couple emails you may have received if you use Venmo. For instance, like the monthly billing statement email. I worked on the code that creates those monthly statements. It's a really cool feeling to be able to work on stuff that millions of people use and interact with every day. But it's also equally as stressful if something goes wrong or you introduce a bug into the code. <laughs> I work mainly in Python, which is actually my favorite programming language because it's versatile, it's easy to read, and it's so widely used that it's easy to find a solution for almost any problem that you run into. Overall though, I had a great time working at Venmo. I worked with some great people, but after the two year mark, I got the urge to try something new again. I know, very millennial of me. <laughs> I started prepping for interviews and leak coding for a few hours a week for about two months. And after countless interviews, I got an offer from Twitter as a software engineer. Twitter was one of the main companies I really wanted to work for. Before all the drama that's been happening with them now, it was known as a really fun, chill place to work. And also they had just announced that they were doing the whole remote forever thing, which I really loved. I love working remote. So yeah, I got hired to work on an internal team within Twitter. So I signed my offer in April of 2022 and gave my two week notice. And I was really excited to join, but also for the fact that I was gonna take my first ever sabbatical. I was gonna take four weeks off between uh, leaving Venmo and working at Twitter to literally just do nothing. Lay on the couch and just binge watch Netflix, which was an exciting time because I never had the luxury of being able to do that, let alone, you know, not work for a month. But literally a day after I signed my offer and gave notice, and I really mean one day, things just got crazy for Twitter and just haven't stopped since. By the time I signed, the news was that Elon bought a bunch of shares and he was going to join the board, which in the grand scheme of things doesn't have as big of an impact as we've obviously seen play out. Then between the day after I signed to my start date, it went from hostile takeover to 
Elon's buying Twitter to news that there may be layoffs coming coming at the end of the year, then news that they were rescinding offers. So at that point, I was already disappointed in going into it with the mindset that I might get laid off in a few months. So maybe I should just start preparing for that now. And then boom, my offer gets rescinded four days before my start date. Honestly, it was bittersweet. On the one hand, I was stressed because I'm like, now I don't have a job. And on top of that, so many companies are doing hiring freezes and layoffs. And it's going to be even harder for me to find a job now. And on top of that, I had just moved into a new apartment and was paying way more than I previously was for my apartment. So I definitely had a lot of fears and definitely did not want to go through the entire interview process again. On the other hand though, I did have a feeling that it would have been equally as bad if they didn't rescind the offer and then I would have started and been laid off in a few months anyway. And another perk is I basically had the entire summer off and I was just here living my best New York summer life. So I am grateful for that. It really made me aspire to be a full-time retiree. Okay, I had to do a quick location change because my neighbor started blasting music. Um, but I was saying, what was I saying? Right, we were talking about Twitter. Okay, yeah, so yeah, sending my offer, not fun. Um, but yeah, I do have a lot of empathy for current and um, ex-Twitter employees that were put in these really not fun, unexpected situations. Being unemployed and not knowing when or what your next role is, is not really a fun state to be in. And I found myself in that exact state when they rescinded my offer. So I got back to interview prepping and after more past and failed technical interviews, um, I got another offer and I started working at that company um, a few months ago. So I've, I've been there for almost four months now. I'm back in the FinTech space as a senior software engineer working on the back end of a data processing system and programming in Java and Python. I don't want to reveal where I work or details about what I work on only because I'm just sharing my own experiences and I don't want people to interpret it as me speaking for the company or any company or school that I mentioned in this video for that matter. But be sure to check out my day in life video if you want to hear more about what a typical day looks like for me as a software engineer. So there it is, my 12 years as an engineer. I hope you enjoyed hearing my story. I wanted to make this video because as a black woman in engineering, I very rarely see myself represented in any of the fields that I've explored or worked in in my 12 years. In most spaces, I'm always the only black person or only person of color in general or only woman. There's this phrase, you can't be what you can't see, which is, so true for so many of us. Even though I knew I wanted to go to college for engineering because of my interest in design and being good at math and science, what really pushed me through school and my career was having people that I could relate to and look up to. As I mentioned earlier, I joined the National Society of Black Engineers when I was in college. And when I became a software engineer, I joined Dev Color, which is a community for black software engineers across the country. It was in those communities that I found black women engineers that were continually raising the bar in their respective fields. And seeing that pushed me to keep going and showed me what was possible for me. But I only got those perspectives and got to meet those women from being in those communities. So I wanted to pay it forward by making this video to hopefully inspire anyone pursuing engineering that can relate to me or my story in any way, or even inspire someone that's never even considered engineering to now pursue it. In the end, it's all about patience and persistence. It's not gonna happen overnight and it's not gonna be easy. I've had plenty of setbacks and pivots throughout my journey, but in the end, it brought me to where I needed to be. So I'm gonna end it here. Please like the video if you enjoyed hearing my story and subscribe to my channel.